We're moving forward again with our next segment. And now for what promises to be the highlight in the agenda today, a Q&A with Peregrine Capital's portfolio managers, which will be moderated by Alan Yates, Peregrine Capital's head of distribution. Thank you to all of you who submitted questions in advance. The portfolio managers will be answering these as well as getting down to the nitty gritty of Peregrine Capital. They will be reviewing 2021's performance as well as discussing what lies ahead in 2022 and beyond for the funds and the markets. I'm sure that many of you would relish the opportunity to have your questions answered here today. A reminder to keep sending any questions or comments you may have in the chat bar. Please join me in welcoming back Jacques Conradi, CEO and Portfolio Manager, David Fraser, Founder, Executive Chairman and Portfolio Manager, and Justin Cousins, Executive Director and Portfolio Manager. Thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your valuable insights and expertise with us this morning. Over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Claire. And uh, first up, just a big thank you to everyone that has submitted these questions. Um, we've been quite blown away by the response. We've had well over 100 questions come through. So unfortunately, we definitely won't be able to get through all of them in this session, but we've certainly tried to cover the overarching themes. Uh, and as Claire mentioned earlier, where there are questions that uh, we didn't get to, we certainly will get back to you either on the platform or, or electronically post the event. So right, chaps, let's uh, dive right in. I think. Um, you know, obviously, uh, start of the year, it's a good time to sort of reflect on the year that has been and uh, the year that was. We obviously have addressed this and covered it relatively in depth in our investor letter, which will be up on the site for you guys to get hold of as well. Um, so maybe just briefly here, let's touch on 2021, Jacques, and maybe go into a little bit of what worked and what didn't for us. So thanks, Alan. Um, and I mean, look, 2020 and 2021 was, was very interesting in the sense that they were almost exact opposites of each other. So in 2020, you got rewarded for being cautious, for having hedges in your portfolio, for creating it on the downside, and then for rotating the portfolio into growth companies or long-term winners that would benefit from COVID lockdowns. In 2021, you had to do almost the exact opposite. You had to be max net long um, with almost no hedges, and you had to pivot back your growth exposure into kind of real world businesses that would benefit from economies opening up. So it was a very interesting few years and, and almost you had to shift your mind 100% to, to, to cope with 2021. Um, if I look at our side as a hedge fund, you always want to have some hedges in place. You can't perfectly predict what a year's outcome is going to be in markets up front. So certainly some of our shorts and hedges drag performance in 2021, given the strength of markets. Um, if I look at things that went well, uh, we pivoted some of the portfolio back into SA, and it was very pleasing how well our stock picking worked. We, we found some great opportunities in, in SA small and mid caps that lagged. Uh, we found some great opportunities in, in, in special situations. So in my presentation, I put all our return buckets up there, and some of those return buckets really pumped. Um, but then on, on the other hand, um, we also went into the year with significant exposure to China. We, we love some of the companies there. They're very high growth businesses, very innovative management teams. And unfortunately for us, uh, Xi just decided that it's not going to be the year where tech companies are going to outperform. And he, I think he, he properly, properly showed them who's boss. And that really significantly hurts us on, on, on the Chinese exposure. And that was probably the single biggest drag by far on our portfolio um, in 2021. I mean, J Justin looks at me uh, at Tech with me, so maybe Justin, you can add a little bit more on the China-specific um, issues we faced. I think when an investor puts money into China, there is a explicit assumption you have to make that the Chinese government will continue to welcome private investment, and you have to understand that it is very much a interventionist type of state, which is very different to what we see in many Western economies. And and 2021 was probably the most um, disruptive year from a regulatory perspective that we've seen in, in many, many years in the Chinese market. 
It was very difficult to predict um, many of these new regulations and, and what they meant for the, the companies that we were invested in. Um, if, if you look at how we've responded, we haven't increased our exposure to China, but we have concentrated our bets into a few names that we really, really like and we've got a lot of conviction in. So the, the three businesses that we continue to own in China are founder-led businesses that generate very high returns on capital, have fantastic growth prospects, and a very, very strong balance sheet. So you know, we, we are extremely bullish about their prospects over the next few years, and we really do feel that the current valuations and share prices provide us with a great opportunity over the next two to three years to make good returns out of our Chinese exposure um, in the remaining three names that we do have exposure to in that market. Look, and I guess it's for me one of those realizations, if you operate long enough in markets, you're going to realize there's going to be regular black swans that hit you and you're going to try to read things right and call them as, as best you can but sometimes things are just fairly unpredictable and we had COVID in 2020 and i think we did a pretty good job of responding rapidly uh, there this one was very very hard to see because you, you can't read what's going on in g's head so i think we did reasonably with the information we had the trading we did was good and obviously sometimes things just on on you aren't able to perfectly forecast them and look it's also important to understand that we are long-term investors i mean we're not we're not, we don't try to optimize returns on a one-month or a three-month basis. We try to make the right decisions for investors over the medium term. That's what worked for us over the last kind of 23 years, and we're going to stick to our knitting and, and keep doing that. And that does mean there's, there's going to be occasional years where you're, kind of, you're slightly below where you want to be because of random things happening. But we're very confident in the portfolio as we stand right now, and hopefully, hopefully um, 22 ends up being a good year. We don't know the black swans that's going to come this year, but feel fairly comfortable on how the portfolio is positioned right now. Great, thanks. So then I think, I mean, turning our focus to the future, obviously we've had lots of questions coming in about what we're expecting from the macro environment globally for 2022. So Dave, maybe I can bring you in here and just ask, what are the, your expectations for, for global markets and, and the big macro themes this year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the way we look at the macro is, 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 is we try and, and we're not really a macro-based returns organization. At the end of the day, although the macro is an important backdrop drop to look at, what we're trying to find is effectively good quality companies at good valuations run by very competent people who we can invest in over the medium and long term. So whether the macro GDP moves 1% or 2% either way really isn't, isn't, shouldn't really affect the long-term valuation of these companies that we invest in. I think that, that we've always been relatively independent of macro, whether it's interest rates, exchange rates. We tr just try and find the best possible companies and, and try and buy them at attractive valuations. And generally, that's the model that's worked. I think if we go back 23 years, the sort of variations we've had, whether it's RAND exchange rate blowing up and then coming all the way back, um, you know, interest rates incredibly high. I mean, uh, it wasn't that long ago we were sort of at the 18 and 20% interest rates in this country. So um, I think what we try and do is just find good quality companies that will perform independent of greater macro events. So the macro to us has never really been that informative, and quite frankly, we'd rather just make sure we buy the right companies, and that's the model that's seen us through this far. I mean, just, just to add to what, what Dave said, the one thing we are cognizant of is that we've almost now had 10 years, more than 10 years since the global financial crisis, where global rates have pretty much been at zero kind of most of the time. It's, I mean, they cut all cut off to 2000, after 2008 and 9, I don't think the U.S. has raised rates in that entire time. The U.S. kind of raised rates to a percent or something and then had to cut again around COVID. So we've had a market where the punch bowl for investors has been within sight at all times. The moment there's a 5 or 10% pullback, the, the Fed pulls the punch bowl back, back out, they up QE um, and, um, and just kind of cut rates again to zero. Where we are now, I mean, my feeling is that the high inflation numbers that we're printing right now, and I mean, I'd like to get your guys' view on this as well, is potentially, has potentially changed the game here. Where this is now a political issue, especially lower income and mid-income people in the EU and the US is being affected by these inflation rates, and politicians are taking notice. They've got to get this under control, otherwise they're going to lose the next election. So for once, my read of the latest Fed meeting is that we do have to probably see several rate hikes here so that they can show they have the discipline of looking after inflation. And, and that's typically a more tricky environment for markets. So if I had to guess, I don't think we're going to be in the same up only mentality we've had for the last 18 months and actually the last 10 years without the COVID hump. Um, it's going to be more of a stock pickers market and you probably have to run slightly lower overall net exposure in that kind of more patchy environment. Yeah. 
Um, I definitely agree with you. Um, the, the one thing that I'd just add to what Jacques has said is we typically have a lot more tools in our box than the typical investor in a long only fund. So we do look to exploit very different opportunities. And you, know, you might be faced with situations where there's corporate bankruptcies or corporate failures, um, uh, unbundlings of you know, various uh, forms. Those present very unique opportunities for us to take advantage of situations that other people don't typically look at, be it in the equity market or in the fixed income space. We also have the ability to, to short shares and um, take advantage of, of pair trading opportunities within sectors. So I think having a, a broad tool set is a very important um, reason why we think that continued outperformance is definitely possible for Peregrine Capital. Uh, and just following on, I, th I think the cornerstone of our philosophy is all about disciplined investing. In other words, companies that generate real products and generate real cash flow. At the end of the day, free money and cheap money um, is something that re doesn't really fit into that sort of bracket. So, um, you know, I've said it before, but even a turkey can fly, fly in a hurricane if, if, if money is cheap. So I, I think if we look at our portfolio, we have very little that's really been a beneficiary of cheap money. I think the, the return to money being worth something and people having to pay interest rates for borrowing money or real interest rates um, is not in, not in fact a bad discipline to have. It means far better capital allocation from companies and companies that will, the companies that will survive and thrive are the ones that are disciplined, that generate free cash flow and don't have debt and continue, they'll continue to do well. So um, I, I think in the last five or six years, I don't really think we've been a massive beneficiary of, of cheap money in our portfolio. We haven't had too many high-flying things that don't generate cash that just rely on, on raising more and more equity or more and more bonds at zero interest. I do think that that is a, a slight differentiator. And I think the days of disciplined investing where companies need to generate the sort of returns in cash to pay shareholders' dividends, I think um, we'd welcome that. I think it's something that we haven't benefited from. And I think a little bit of discipline coming back into the market will, may not be a bad thing for us. I mean, to that point, Dave, I mean, most of our companies sit with net cash on the balance sheet. So if anything, they earn more on that rather than pay more away on the debt. And I think there's a case to be made that actually because we own these quality franchises, that if anything, the low rates and free money has, has made it easier for smaller companies to, to compete with them with that free money. And that going away on the margin, I think, is probably more good for our portfolio than, than bad the way we're positioned right now. Great. Thanks. So the most common question we've received, and I think this is the most common question every asset manager in South Africa receives, is what are our expectations for the mighty czar and the South African economy? So, I mean, against that backdrop of this being a, a stock-picking business and a, and a, and a bottom-up business, not a top-down business, Dave, how does that factor into our SA stock selection, or does it not factor into our SA stock selection, and how do we kind of think about these things uh, locally? Yeah, I think when we look at the RAND, we've got to try and, 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 and introduce a balance on each side. I think on the positive balance for the RAND, clearly commodity prices have been relatively robust over the last 12 or 18 months. I think South Africa has massively benefited from that, both in the balance of payments as well as tax receipts. So that clearly has made SA Inc.'s balance sheet more resilient than it otherwise would have been, certainly through COVID. So that has really been a bright spot, which I think is is, is shown through in a, in a slightly stronger rand. But then we start looking at the negatives. I mean, we're, a, we're on the second uh, state capture report at the moment. I mean, I, I, I think people really are not at under or are, are, are underestimating the sort of um, the length it's going to take South Africa to recover, particularly in our two major utilities being Eskom, we back in load shedding, and Transnet, ironically, where these are two absolutely key pillars to this economy. And both have been undermined over an extended period. And I think it's naive to think that these things can be fixed in two or three years of, 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 of decent management. I think that the rot has, 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 has taken so long, five, six, eight years in these organizations, that unless we, we, we have pretty significant interventions into these organizations, they will be a headwind for SA Inc. going forward. So it really is a balance right now with, with, with the... the the damage that state capture has done over the medium term, and again, the positive commodity boom that we're going through right now, um, which obviously has, has, has assisted South Africa in the short term. And, and look, I, I think to add to that, we, 
we have the discipline and the honesty to, to know what we're good at and to know what we're not good at. And in my view, um, we are half decent stock pickers. We can analyze a company and try to forecast how that business will perform versus its peers. We are not particularly good. We're only probably slightly above average in calling the RAND. So for that reason, we do, we are disciplined around this. We set ourselves range in the ranges in the portfolio of our RAND versus dollar versus other, other offshore currency exposures. And we don't materially trade around that in, in, in those ranges. And right now we're kind of in the middle of our range. I don't think we have a particularly strong view either way. And look, I, I think the RAND has this knack of doing the opposite of when the, what the pundits say it will do. So uh, again, we, we just, Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to give you a firm answer there. It's just one of those things that's it's very, very difficult to call. I think just to frame it from a, a portfolio construction perspective, it's also important so investors understand or understand how the portfolio should behave if the RAND blows out. So as an example, if the RAND happens to depreciate by 10%, your investors in the high growth fund, all things equal, should expect that fund to appreciate or, or benefit to the extent of 25 to 3.5% on average. And with the, the pure hedge fund, that benefit will be slightly smaller at one and a half to two and a half percent. Um, and the opposite is obviously true if, if the RAND appreciates like it has more recently. Perfect. Thank you. So, I mean, with that macro backdrop in place, which isn't a slam dunk for, for the SA markets, how do we feel about SA markets? Um, you know, wh where do we think returns are going to come from this year and into the future? Uh, and you know, what are you guys seeing as, as being interesting right now in SA? Well, I think if we could specifically identify the returns, then we'd be, we'd, we'd be sitting somewhere else. I think that um, you know, um, if we look at last year, for example, our single biggest winner um, was a resource share called, called Tungela. As we sat, if we sat at the same place here last year, that would not have been predictable. It had only listed in, in, in June, this, June last year. And in fact, um, ended up being a real, really good performer for the fund. And I think that that just tells you that we just need to be ready for opportunities because sure as night follows day, we're going to find nice opportunities. We talked a little bit about South African companies. I mean, we're seeing, you know, almost day after day, South African mid and small, mid and, 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 and sort of larger cap companies actually surprising us on the earnings front on the upside. There's no doubt that COVID has affected companies very differently. And if you're in a, a company that has some pricing power and has the ability to source stock and ability to sort of um, pass on its, its sort of pricing or input costs, I think it's been quite a, quite a nice time for some South African companies. Now, it's not for everyone because, you know, some for food producers, for example, have had margin squeeze. Some food producers have been able to recover margin. So it is very stock specific. And that's exactly the sort of market that we, we, we tend to thrive in. It's about fundamental analysis of individual companies, their ability to, to, to navigate through COVID, stock shortages, um, all sorts of other challenges that they face, and come out the other side delivering really good earnings results. So ironically, we're seeing a little bit of a purple patch at the moment where certainly in the last few weeks, we've been almost upside surprised in four out of five SA companies that we cover, and sometimes quite significantly so. So... That's pretty heartening that, that there is real life in this economy and a real ability for good, well-managed South African companies to generate really good returns for their, for their shareholders. And that's exciting for us. I mean, Dave, to add to that, I think in SA, we know our companies well. And if you know that, those companies well, in any year, there's going to be various opportunities that various events throw, throw at you. I mean, so one of the nice trades last year was, um, let's uh, I look at the financial sector and um, the banks early on, there was great fears that they would take massive impairments around COVID through lockdowns. People weren't going to get income. Companies weren't going to get income. So they all had to take massive provisions during 2020. And as the economy opened up in 2021 and the SA economy actually rebounded, it was, it was clear that most of those impairments wouldn't actually happen. So they all sat on significant excess provisions that actually we saw would have to be released. And on the other hand, the insurance companies in SA initially was less impacted by COVID. What's now happened with the fact that COVID hasn't gone away after one wave, there's been wave after wave after wave and variant after variant, is kind of the mortality claims the insurance companies faced actually kept coming wave after wave. So if anything, the insurance companies are now much more negatively impacted than the banks. So there was a great opportunity to buy banks, short the insurance companies against them for us to make money. And then additionally, around December, with the initial fears around Omicron and that Friday morning when we got all the red lists put on the UK red list and the US red list, 
uh, the banks got smashed and we were massive buyers of them at that stage. Valuations were just far too cheap. So the SA market, if you know it well, it's always going to deliver nice trading opportunities. There might not be the structural growth that we see offshore, but you can still make 20, 30, 40% on SA shares if you know them well and trade them correctly. I think what's key to understand also is that you know, expected return is a function of both the price that you pay as well as the growth in, in future cash flows that will be delivered by the businesses that we own. So if you look at the South African market as a whole, the market might not be growing, but within that you have companies that are taking market share, you've got companies that are losing market share, you've got corporate un unbundlings, you've got takeouts, you've got uh, failures, which often present very interesting opportunities for us on the fixed income side. So if we look at the property space in South Africa last year, another great um, opportunity that came out of COVID was the fact that all property companies were effectively treated the same as a result of COVID. What I mean there is that every single one of them, correlations went to one and they got sold, sold off indiscriminately during 2020. Now, the market didn't discern between uh, a high quality retail business with a very strong balance sheet and a low quality office focused REIT that had a much weaker balance sheet. So, we had the opportunity to, to take a long position in the retail focused REITs with the strong balance sheets and take a short position in these, these office focused REITs that we, we've been covering for long periods of time. The, the beauty of that trade is that we were able to do that uh, at exactly the same price or discount to, to net asset value for those companies. And as you saw more data coming through over the course of 21, we saw that the shape of the recovery was very different where those retail focused REITs did very well, where the office uh, focused REITs continued to languish. And, and that is a fantastic pair and that, that recovery has now been reflected in both the share prices um, and, and has pre presented a fantastic opportunity for us to generate uncorrelated alpha for the funds. I think with a tailwind in, in, in economies, it's very difficult to find management differentiation. But as soon as you get into tougher times like COVID where management teams have been tested and tried and have had to make quite ballsy decisions about how far to uh, how far to order stock ahead how much to pad their orders knowing they're going to be going to be cut back i think these are the type of times where a, a better management team absolutely increases the gap between an average management team and we always try and stick with the best possible managers because they're on the ground and they're going to steer our our, our money through um, difficult times like that. So there's no doubt that when in COVID is a tough time for, for managing. And those are the kind of guys you want to stick with is the better guys will make that gap bigger over COVID, which is what we've seen right now with earnings results. And, and, and our size at 12 billion in assets, it's actually quite a nice size to still trade the SA market. We can take advantage of these 20 or 30% repricings. We can buy a share does the 20 or 30 percent we can sell we can redeploy that capital in the next opportunity if you're 100 billion rand plus you kind of got to be taking two or three year bets so you can't make money or take advantage of those churning of ideas and i think it's a, it's going to be a market we think where um you're going to have to trade a little bit more and and rotate capital a little bit more and i think we're very well positioned for that awesome thanks so i mean one of the other major themes that's come through in the questions today is is really to look at the longer term so yeah you know, three five ten years out what are the what are the big trends that we're looking at? What are the things that we find exciting and, and maybe some of the future tech uh, or, or more just long-term themes that we're looking at uh, as a business? Shark, maybe you can give us your input. Yeah, so, so look, I think technological change and technology is something most people in our team is, is very passionate about. And that's why for the last effectively kind of three, four years, most of our analysts and portfolio managers, we spend a fair amount of our time looking at um, offshore ideas, growth ideas, technology ideas, to, to realize and figure out where the world is going and to make sure that the companies we own, we understand how they're going to be infected by technological change, how they're going to be affected by, by new competition. Um, so if anything, I, I think versus most other SA managers, we are well positioned for a rapidly changing world. We've been investing that time over multiple years. If anything, from the trends we're seeing, um, things like machine learning and AI, it's going to more and more rapidly impact kind of real world companies. Um, and, and I think in, in the end, tech will take more market share from physical businesses. And it is a bit of a worry for a country like SA, the fact that we don't have spectacular high growth tech startups here. So it means more and more of the economy eventually will happen on Google or Facebook or these large global tech companies 
um, where the advertising spend will go and even where the e-commerce or the search revenue will go. So I think to some extent you, you need to do this. If you want to invest well in SA, you need to have a, a, a view of these trends. And then also figuring out what the trends are that's not yet in the market. So something like the cryptocurrency space, uh, while I think most people thought three or four years ago this was a Ponzi scheme or a bubble that's going to go away, it now does seem that more and more there is some real innovation happening in that space. There are lots of the type of people that joined Facebook or Google or Microsoft a few years ago are now joining Web3 startups and it's having a, a real potential impact on, on several companies. So that's a space we are keeping a close eye on to, to see what trends are, are coming out of that space and, and potentially whether that is the next wave of disruption that's, that's sitting there and brewing. Great, thanks. And then finally, we've had quite a few questions asking about uh, what we offer investors and, and what differentiates us to the rest of the market. I mean, obviously, nowadays in, in this industry and in most industries, I suppose, investors have a huge range of choice. Uh, they certainly have access to significantly better information than they have in, in the past. Um, so I suppose, put in another way, Dave, what makes us different and what differentiates Peregrine Capital from the rest of the market? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think maybe I can bring in a in context like a position like Tungela, where, quite frankly, it wasn't on the radar screen at all. It's not really our, our, our sort of comfort zone. Um, Tungela is the old Anglo coal that got delisted from the market over 20 years ago. Therefore, nobody really knew anything about it. And, and we had a very small window knowing that it was going to get unbundled out of, out of Anglo. And, and Jock and I spent better part of a weekend, just understanding it, going through the investor day, going through the modeling, trying to understand what the cost base was, trying to understand what was going to happen on the unbundling. And it was very clear that, 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 that what was going to happen there is that investors who received literally less than 1% of the Anglo shielding in a, in a coal company um, were generally going to dump the thing as soon as they, they saw it in their portfolios. And obviously, we very quickly modeled the company, modeled what it could do, understood the margin of safety with the coal price and the, and, and the rand dollar exchange rate, and very quickly understood that this was really one of those fat pitches that we, we, needed to be, we needed to be part of. And I think that's the kind of, 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 of flat structure and rapid decision making that you will get with Peregrine Capital and with an ability to, to, to back ourselves to do it and back ourselves to go into the market and after the unbundling to be the buyer of not last resort, but certainly mopping up all the shares that were just hitting the market from indiscriminate selling. I think that's the kind of thing you get with Peregrine Capital, flat structure, quick decision making, experienced people, and hopefully more of those type of investment uh, opportunities. And I mean, to that specific point, it, it often looks easy on the graph to say, oh, something's up two or three times like it, it was obvious to buy at that stage. But to your point, Dave, when everyone's dumping a share, it takes a fair amount of conviction and self-belief step up and take when, when people are just selling relentlessly. And I think most long owned institutions, it's very hard as a junior analyst or a fund manager to be recommending something when everyone's dumping it. Because if you're right, I mean, it's kind of nice and you make some money, but if you were wrong and you were, bu you were buying when everyone thought this was a bad idea, then, then you, almost you're the lone guy out of the crowd that, that got this wrong. And that's big pressure on, on your prospects at the business and on your credibility there. So, so it's, it's much harder than one thinks to have the culture where you really believe in yourself and you're willing to say, we're right here, the whole market's wrong, we're going to sit there and, and, and be on the bid and keep buying shares. And I, I think that's really something special that, that we have in our business that will back each other and, and the team will support it when they see the, the work's been done. And I think from, from my perspective, there's, there's three components that I think really do set us apart from the rest. The first is our people. We really do try to employ the best people that we can possibly find and I think that's absolutely critical. You, you then have to make it a very meritocratic process around those people to make sure that the best people continue to uh, feel motivated and rewarded. Um, another thing we speak about often is the alignment of interest with our investors. I think there is no other company in the country on the asset management side that is as aligned with their investors as Peregrine Capital is. We eat our own cooking and we really believe what we, what we, in, in what we are doing and what we're offering to our clients. I think the, the final thing from my perspective is, is, is a time-tested investment philosophy that serves as, as our North Star in every one of these difficult situations that Jacques and Dave have been referring to, where you really have to make a call that is non-consensus and, and, and very um, brave in, in hindsight or, or definitely at the time. So those are the three things for me, probably you know, people, alignment, and a fantastic investment philosophy that, that we've, we, we really believe in.
I just want to add to your point on, on people, Justin. I think, um, I think most companies, not just asset managers, most businesses, and most people, in fact, are somewhat scared or cautious of conflict. They don't want to ask difficult questions or co cause conflict. And one of the beautiful things in our business that makes it difficult at times is we, we try to hire people that's willing to ask the hard questions and, and stimulate the debate. And if there's an issue, like someone will bring it up and we'll have to debate it. So, um, and I, I love that about our culture, the fact that you will be challenged. No one will kind of take anyone's word as law. Like we've got a lot of independent, strong thinkers, there's certainly no yes men or yes women in, in Peregrine Capital. So while that makes for tough debates at times, I think that gets you more consistently to the right answer when you're willing to have that deep, hard discussion, kind of op open up, look, be look below the hood. And I, I think that, kind of that that's really a key differentiator. And, and, and again, to the alignment point, uh, just having most of your key portfolio managers and analysts with a majority of their own money in the fund next to investors that is just different than people doing this for a job. If you know it's your own money on the line there, it's your, I don't know, your, your kind of family, your friends. I mean, you think differently about the portfolio when you know it's kind of your money and your friends' money and people that you know that you'll have to be accountable to. It just creates great accountability and, and kind of an, an extra level of, of diligence goes into the, the management of the funds. You feel it on the up days and the, you feel it on the down days. And, and I yeah. think there's nothing like... Um, some pain to focus the mind. At the end of the day, unfortunately, we wish we didn't, but we do make mistakes. And I think um, one of the real advantages of our business is those mistakes are unpacked and we learn from them. At the end of the day, you know, uh, we just mustn't, we must never make the same mistake again. We have to learn from it and we have to learn the next time, that, you know, unpack that mistake, understand why we made it, understand how we could have avoided it, and then put it away. There are tough conversations that are had and, 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 Everyone can sort of attest to that. And it's just to get to the right answer. It's just to get the right answer so that everybody continues to build as a person. You know, one thing I've learned in, in, in my time in fund management is you're just never going to get it right. There is no perfection in this industry. If you want perfection, you need to pick something else to do. It just is, it's a contact sport. There are going to be disappointments. You just got to know how to handle them and how to get the best out of those situations so you minimize them going forward. You will never eliminate them. And I think that, that's an important part of our, our, our process is where there, is, where there are mistakes have been made. There is real introspection and real hard conversations and real learnings to be taken out of it, which hopefully stand us in good stead for the, for the medium term and, and those mistakes are never made again. I mean, maybe one other thing that jumped to mind as, as David spoke now is uh, many years ago, I had a conversation with the CEO of one of the large insurance companies that had one of the large asset managers there. And he says his mandate to his team is to stay close to the index. Don't go far out. Like we've, we've got the distribution team to get the assets in. And as long as you get your like second or third quarter, that's fine. And we're really just asset gatherers that wants to collect that management fee. Stick in the pack. Yes, precisely. Just be in the middle of the pack. And I can promise you for sure that is not, uh, that's not the mindset here. We are highly driven to outperform. We're never going to index hug. Uh, we're going to take those learnings and we're going to kind of try to find the next best ideas. And hopefully over time, over the last 23 years, it's worked. And, and hopefully it continues to work well going forward. Awesome. I think we've got time for, for one final question. So let me pose this one to you. Doc, how do we feel currently about the uh, portfolio of businesses that we own in the funds? Uh, and is this time going to be different? So, so Al, I mean, if, if I look at the, the last few years, it's really been quite a macro and sector driven market. Like in 2020, you almost had to just avoid COVID, avoid real world companies, property companies and buy growth. And then 2020, one, flip that around, um, not own growth, own, own reopening trade. So it's been very much a macro sector driven call. And I think we've done reasonably in that, mar in that market, but we've always done best, um, not necessarily in a down or upward trending market, but maybe just a, a stable market where it's really a stock pickers um, paradise. And, and I think if we look at this year, that's, that's kind of what I think it's gonna be. It's gonna be about finding the right company that's mispriced, that's too cheap for its, uh, its outlook, and that's gonna surprise the market on the upside. And I think that that really is our forte. That's, that's what we're comfortable with. That, that's what we're good, good at. And then if I look at the, 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 the shares in the fund right now, we've already seen that in the last three or six months. We've found some really nice opportunities in SA, and some of them's already worked and we've banked them, but there's some really nice ones sitting there where we're just waiting for the catalyst to play out. And our global shares, most of them have um, gone up less than they grew their earnings by losses. So and most of them have derated and are sitting cheaper right now than they were a year ago, uh, especially after the January we've had in markets. 
So look, it, one can never call the markets a year ahead. I, I can't be sure about where things end, but I can say that we are very excited about um, the portfolio we have right now, and, and we're going to be the best, do, do our best to execute well in 2022. I echo the sentiments with respect to the portfolio. Definitely feel that we're in a very um, good space at the moment, and we've got the capacity to find fantastic new ideas uh, over the coming months. Um, I know that the team is in a very good headspace at the same time as well. And after all the introspection of 2021, um, we, we're all feeling extremely motivated and hungry to make sure that this is going to be a, a fantastic year for us. Um, so I think we have very firm foundations upon which to build. I think from, from my side, obviously incredibly difficult to, to predict markets and, and outcomes in, in the year ahead. I think that there's no doubt that there probably will be a less of a tailwind from markets, as I think Jock sort of alluded to. And I think under those sort of markets where good news is rewarded and bad news is punished, that's always been a very happy hunting ground for Peregrine Capital in the way we, we set up our portfolios. I think we've got some, some, some great positions in the fund that are still got lots of time to sort of mature and and effectively the value to come through nicely. So we, as we sit right now, we feel pretty comfortable about this year and whatever it may throw at us. And I, 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 we know there's going to be unpredictability. We know there's going to be stuff from left field. As we, we've learned to live with, you know, there's, there's too many black swan events for them to, to be all, all sort of black swans. So as we sit right now, we're, we feel pretty comfortable about the composition of the portfolio and the outlook for the year. And I think just in closing from my side, um, to our investors, I'd just like to thank you all very much for the confidence you've shown us. I think we don't take that responsibility of managing your money lightly. I think it's something that we really do feel the responsibility for. And we thank you again for entrusting your hard-earned wealth with us. And we certainly do our best to grow it on an on a annual basis. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. And uh, thank you all for your time. And uh, thank you all for tuning in and, uh, and having a listen to us. And uh, we really are appreciative. Thank you very much.